So I'm really happy that I get to speak with you all. This is like an incredible lineup of people that I greatly admire. Uh, so, oh, can you hear me if I'm like over here? Okay, sorry, it's, it's all good. Um, Alain Berteau, I heard you speak, is Alain still here? Uh, there you are. I heard you speak a number of years ago, I was at the World Bank, and you gave a talk. Uh, I was working in urban development there, and I thought, I've, I've been an admirer of yours ever since. And uh, Mark, you've, one of the things I love about what Mark is doing is he's putting together a group of like practitioners on this stuff. So much of this type of thing is all kind of talk about big ideas and, and sort of laying out these great, this great vision for special status cities. And, um, but what we're sort of seeing coming together, thanks to Mark, is a lot of these like practitioners, people who really know how to put the right machinery in place. Like Tom is one of those people who, Tom and I have worked together quite a bit and helping, uh, Tom has done so much important work helping think out what the legal uh, infrastructure, the legal uh, uh, coding is like for these, for these places and, and pushing the idea out there. So um, it's a great, uh, you guys should feel very lucky that you have such a great uh, panel of practical experts here. Uh, I didn't, as you can see, I don't have a, a PowerPoint. I was just talking with my wife uh, out here and she was, she was saying, she asked me if I had a PowerPoint and I was like, no. And she said, well, do you have jokes? And I said, well, I guess I could improvise some jokes. And, and then I thought I'd spare you. So, because that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be very nice. So, but hopefully um, that some of the, what I, what I have to say here is interesting. My, my, my goal here is to kind of give you a sense for uh, how, what the legal and public policy and generally speaking governance institutions of special zones work and how, how it's changing and how each of us, especially those of us working in this field uh, that I hope can, um, we're, uh, directions we can take this zone's tool for uh, influencing some of the major pressing problems facing our cities, facing countries, and facing the world. Um, so let me start with a little bit about what a special economic zone is. I'm not gonna dwell on this because other people are talking about this and, and a lot of you know it. Uh, I like to look at special economic zones as designated areas designed to promote development through a distinct policy and administrative framework. So you take a geographical area and give it a pol give it public policies and administration that's somehow different from the surrounding, from the area around it. Um, so many zones are kind of much more mundane. Uh, a lot of zones just kind of are, are really just sort of like low tax areas or something. It's like you come locate here, you don't have to pay corporate income tax or something like that. Or there's trade benefits or something. Uh, sometimes there's not even that. Um, more and more though, we're seeing this crucial role for zones as incubators of good governance. Um, and that has explosive potential, I think, to, to change the world. Um, so the legal and regulatory framework I view as the most central aspect of special economic zones. The, the geographic, the administrative, the infrastructure in there is not as important. A special economic zone is basically an industrial park, you know, an area designated for industries with good infrastructure with a special legal framework over it. And more and more we're seeing resident, residential components or city-like, more mixed-use city-like uh, special economic zones. Um, but Special economic zones is sort of a catch-all term that is increasingly being used to describe a number of different like things that, uh, a number of different phenomena around, including export processing zones, free trade zones, free ports, uh, but even more and more we're seeing these sort of almost quasi-city-state like entities or these sort of uh, highly autonomous uh, areas. Um, in uh, so, in recent years, we're paying more attention to special economic zones as vehicles for policy and structural transformation, including helping catalyze growth in new industry sectors, but especially overcoming political roadblocks to beneficial legal reforms. So, um, why do you create zones? Why do governments 
create zones. There are usually, there's a few kind of common goals that are sort of advertised that are sort of put up front, and then there's some goals that are like, are sort of really working behind the scenes, I think. Um, one of the sort of advertised goals, the most common thing, is attracting foreign investment, FDI, into the country, or boosting exports. That was especially huge in like the 60s and 70s and so on, when, when tariff barriers were still high. Uh, countries would be, would have an import substitution regime or something like that that they were trying to, uh, to compensate for and have and boost exports. Um, but also attracting foreign investment is still a very strong motivation. Um, economic diversification uh, is one. So some countries like Qatar, where I've worked, uh, developed its Qatar economic zones as sort of, uh, as hopefully areas where they could diversify off an oil-based, an oil-dependent economy and into other sectors. So we're working with them to look at like what are the, the downstream industries like uh, you know, fertilizer and plastics and all these things that you can make from the byproducts of, of, uh, of petroleum production. Um, some countries where I've worked, like Bangladesh, have been, all, have been using, since the 80s, have been, really been using zones to try to diversify away from uh, garments and textiles into more advanced sectors. They keep trying to push like high-tech industries. Um, and for reasons I, we may get into if there's time a little bit later on, or, uh, it's, it's a very challenging thing to do that often doesn't work well. Uh, another important goal, what we're seeing with special economic zones more, is poverty reduction. And, and uh, you know, community revitalization, revitalizing impoverished or distressed areas. Um, so you see this with Mexico's new special economic zone program has a, a distinct component. That the zones were designed to try to lift people out of poverty in the southern states where violence is most rampant and uh, there's a lot of corruption in government where drug cartels sort of control things. Um, but the U.S. has also had similar sort of zones that, uh, like U.S. the opportunity zones. Um, they, there's just something new in the in the uh, that, that's they, they've been always sort of tweaking the opportunity zones to make them better. Uh, President Obama had promise zones um, that had sort of a similar had more of a social component to them. Uh, these are all really important. It's it's. Um, uh, Another, another goal is uh, cluster development. You'll hear this, economists talk about this a lot, the benefit of clusters. Um, the, whether these, whether uh, using zones as cl as to build clusters uh, is actually successful, the jury's still out on that one. Um, a lot of people rightly point out that clusters are probably the result of good economic activity happening. In other words, a business is, is doing uh, is doing very well and other businesses cluster around them sort of organically. And so it doesn't really work to necessarily force that kind of cluster development into a zone. But it's, it's, uh, it's a motivation out there. But I want to talk about what I think are the more important aspects to what's hap what, what happens with zones. And uh, that is the impact on reforms and on political incentives that happen. And that's what my consulting firm is mainly sort of built around, is, is helping structure zones to uh, advance beneficial public policy reforms and uh, to, to adjust, uh, to work within the political economy. Um, so one way in which zones are used to advance reforms is through sort of showcasing good ideas or using them as sort of experimental areas, it's sort of like some new idea where uh, that, that a government wants to test out, and so they pilot it within within an area, and and it's and if it's so it's, if it's a showcase, it's sort of used as a way to build political will for this idea to spread it nationwide or statewide or citywide or something. Uh, you've heard similar things recently with um, universal basic minimum income, sort of a hot uh, issue here in San Francisco in the tech area, and California is rolling it out in one of the cities. Um, and so it's a sort of an example of how, of sort of a zone model that's really being done by a city. Um, zones also can advance reforms in a weird way when the alternative is going to be much worse or when things are moving in a bad direction and the zone sort of operates to preserve things. So one example I think of this is actually the way the U.S. foreign trade zones emerged. U.S. foreign trade zones are areas where 
uh, that, that are essentially customs uh, exempt areas where you can import products duty free. You can make them into something, you can manufacture them into something, and then sell them domestically. And usually, the finished product is sold at a is has a lower tariff rate uh, than than the in, all the in, inputs that you import. Or you can export it abroad, sell the finished product abroad, and you never have to pay tariffs on it at all. So it's a neat little thing. But it emerged during a time in U.S. history where tariffs were extremely high. Um, you know, in the I think the av the some of the economists might correct me on this, but I think the, the average tariff rate was somewhere around like the 40-something percent on most goods. And the foreign trade zones were actually introduced just before they got a lot higher, or they, they got bumped up by the Smoot-Hawley Act. And um, so the foreign trade zones were sort of like, these are areas where the impact of these high tariffs are going to be like greatly lessened. Um, the... Uh, zones can also work to sort of alter the political economy. It's some of the things I was talking about earlier. The, um, you can, you can it, uh, incentivize government officials to, uh, to want to see, to, to, to benefit from the reforms because of, by making sure that they uh, have positive, you know, political benefits when they, when the zones succeed. I'll get into a little bit more about what I mean by that a little bit later on. But I want to talk about, there, there's, a, there's a bad example of the way zones work with reforms, too. And, and uh, the Dominican Republic provides sort of a useful example. A lot of people believe that the Dominican zones were introduced because the country was sort of moving towards trade liberalization, towards and, and lowering tariff barriers. And the government sort of used the zones as, as a pressure valve, in other words, we're about reforms, these reforms are about to spread over the entire country. That's, and the, the people in power didn't want those reforms spread across the entire country. So they say, we'll give you a zone instead, and that'll keep you happy. So we'll, we'll promote trade liberalization here. That way we don't need to liberalize the rest of the country. And that's a negative use of zones in terms of reforms, I think. Um, so political dynamics of zones. Um, so, as you can kind of gather from what I'm saying, a lot of the, the real impact of zones is not just sort of the traditional economic indicate. It's not, it's not just like the amount of investment you're attracting, the number of jobs you're creating. The real uh, impact is in the political uh, impacts. It can help governments, they, they can become political economy tools for helping overcome rent-seeking systems. In other words, uh, uh, rent-seeking uh, and again, the economists can correct me here, but is, is essentially ways of earning money that don't add any value to the overall economy. So an example are government officials sort of doling out special privileges to well-connected elites, rather than forcing those elites to compete against other businesses in a more open and level playing field. You know, bribes and uh, forcing and requiring licenses for things that you shouldn't really require a license for, and licenses only go to people who dole out to pay bribes and, and are, uh, are, are friends of the people in power. Uh, China's special economic zones provide a really interesting case study, I think, of how these political, uh, how the political economy dynamics of special economic zones and how they can have a real positive impact. So in 1978, China was still very much under Maoist uh, uh, policies regarding investment and trade. Um, and a group of Chinese businessmen in the Guangdong province uh, wanted exemptions from restrictions on trade and foreign investment. So they approached the Ministry of Transport, and the Minister of Transport liked the idea, and they, eventually the governor of Guangdong province got involved, and he started pushing for it at the national level. Now, why would he do this? So the governor was, like most, most officials at the time, benefited from like this rent-seeking or patronage system where he sort of benefits the, the well-connected elites uh, and to the detriment of like of real economic growth happening in the country. Um, but there's two interesting factors to the political dynamics in China at the time. One is, is that China was not a democracy, clearly. Um, and the, the way you got a, a promoted as a government official was by 
uh, was, was all entirely controlled by the central government. And when the central government was determining which provincial officials to, to rise up, which municipal officials and which to get rid of, was determined by the economic growth in your province there. So if you're a provincial official, you really want like strong GDP numbers coming out of your province because that you're gonna work your way up into the Communist Party hierarchy at the time. Um, also, uh, the, 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 the fiscal structure is highly decentralized, which meant that a lot of the tax revenue generated from your province, would st a large portion of that would stay in your province and so you can use it to, to build infrastructure projects and to, to reinvest it there. Um, so all of this meant that government officials' personal and professional ambitions were tied up in, in economic growth, but at the same time, like the governor of Guangdong province doesn't want to upset the people that benefit from the status quo, the, the Communist Party ideologues in the central government, and he doesn't want to upset the, the well-connected elites that are benefiting from the system. So what does he do? He says, well, let's designate a zone where we're going to have more open and competitive and transparent free market-oriented policies, uh, but everywhere else we'll operate under the status quo. And that keeps, that keeps all of the elites and everybody happy on the outside, but then you've, you've got an area for incubating good reform. So, and, and uh, people have talked about the tremendous impact of Shenzhen that I don't, I don't need to go into, Shenzhen being probably the most successful special economic zone in China, and how special economic zones have just sort of like spread all over the country now, so that they're not really ex areas of exception anymore, they're becoming the rule in terms of uh, uh, you know, the economic policy. Uh, so the lessons from this are that good zones emerge beginning with a small group of reform-oriented political leaders who aren't able to secure, uh, you know, nationwide uh, reform for their ideas. They can't get a majority behind their ideas, but they are able to develop a special status, uh, a special status for a limited area in which their reforms can be launched. And also they're structured so that the people with controls over the fortunes of the zone, over the, of the prospects of the zone, benefit when the special economic zone benefits. Uh, so which is an example of like what was happening with, with Shenzhen. So that's how special economic zones sort of emerge and, and sort of what their, their goals are. How special economic zones thrive. I really believe it is through uh, a special legal framework, special policies creating policies that are more open, fair, transparent, and competitive, create a better environment for, for living and working. Um, they are, uh, the, the location matters greatly. Um, you know, it, designating zones and areas that are, where there's high demand, rather than there's a lot of boondoggle projects of special economic zones where you, where you designate a zone in some area because it's politically advantageous to, to put it over there, but really there's no market demand for, for building the zone over there. Um, and uh, industrial selection, a lot of governments have a very strong uh, inclination to promote certain industries within zones, and a lot of times uh, that can be, they, they can get it wrong in terms of where there's demand for it. Um, Institutions and entities, so this also is, I think, a crucial part of it. The people with power over the zone, the people running the zone, should have the authority, the knowledge, and the incentive to make zones succeed. It's the authority, knowledge, and incentive to make them succeed. Authority comes, and something I've worked with a lot, I've always been uh, pushing zones to have more, is as a sort of a best practice, is a, is a zone's regulatory authority, a, de a designated uh, authority for the zone that is able to perform a lot of the functions of government on its own, um, independently. It makes things much more streamlined and efficient to do that. Um, but also, the zones, in order to, to have, for the knowledge component, these, these administrative authorities should be close to the ground so they're able to react to local developments, local conditions. And, uh, and respond effectively. Um, incentive. Uh, the Special Economic Zone's administrative authority should benefit or fail depending on how well the Special Economic Zone accomplishes its objectives. So what does this look like? What are the institutions? Um, I, I sort of hinted at uh, a regulator, which is often a government or a public entity with, with powers to implement new laws independently. 
uh, and often through a one-stop shop so that businesses, residents can deal with government by, but through a single point of contact and, uh, and not have to go through a, a complex bureaucracy. Uh, and that regulator should be close enough to the ground to respond effectively to issues. Uh, and with the emergence of these more city-sized special economic zones, you know, democratic accountability can, can, be, can work on the incentives. Obviously, that's why democracy uh, works, is because uh, you know, government officials become accountable to how well things are, are working. And more of that can, I think, can benefit zones in terms of the government the regulatory component. But another very important uh, entity is the developer or operator. And this is an entity that owns the land or has a long-term lease from the government and develops the basic infrastructure, some of the basic structures, can develop utilities there, can, um, uh, and provide services to the area. Uh, to address the knowledge problem, uh, Private development and operation, or public-private partnerships, have worked extremely well. It's been a, there's been a trend towards more and more private development and operation of zones. Uh, private companies are able to respond to market conditions, and they know how to develop high-quality services. Uh, there's anecdotal evidence saying that uh, privately operated zones perform much better in, in terms of social and environmental uh, outcomes, including gender parity and, and other things. Um, Private operators also help deal with the incentive problem, with aligning incentives, because developers uh, profit from how well the zone functions. So especially if they're owning all the land, they want land value to increase, and the way you do that is by attracting more and more people or businesses into the area to make the land more desirable. Um, uh, Alex uh, Tabarok is, uh, has done a, some really interesting work on co the correlation between land value and the quality of governance in, in India. And uh, I think that's, that's extremely, uh, it's an extremely important uh, thing to tie whoever's running the zone, to tie their incentives to land value is, uh, can be a very powerful tool for linking incentives with good governance. Um, so some of the trends. Zones are, as I talked about, they're sort of morphing into these sort of more semi-autonomous areas. We're seeing more and more of these places like the Dubai International Financial Center, the Abu Dhabi Global Markets, and, and other places uh, that we've talked about with new independent court systems, totally new legal, uh, n new laws covering a wide range of topics. Um, that's, that's sort of what the, at the uh, you know, the the pioneering end of zones is go, going in that direction. Um, also, as I mentioned, private development and operation of special economic zones has, has risen greatly since the 1980s. Before that, most zones were all were operated by government entities. Uh, the, the trend is towards private development and operation. So, and the last thing I want to talk about is what, what are some of the pressing priorities for special economic zones? I think our challenge with zones and with, uh, and with charter cities and, and other these, these types of projects is to avoid the, uh, the reality of these zones being sort of isolated enclaves where wealth and people can kind of escape from, uh, from the surrounding area and, and, don't and, and so no longer benefit the, the areas around them. Where there's very few spillover effects. Um, we need to move zones from being these isolated enclaves over to uh, zones that can help pressing uh, global issues, including displacement. So one of the areas, one of the projects that I have working on is, is uh, called Refugee Cities. Uh, I'm working on a project to, to take the special economic zone concept over into areas where there's mass displacement, where there's um, a huge popul a huge number of either internally displaced people or refugees in an area, and using the zone as a place to integrate them into the economy uh, around them so that both refugees and people from the host country are working there. Uh, and they can start businesses and to have a supporting legal framework that supports economic activity. Um, also, uh, 
environmental issues. There's places like Mazdar City and other, other zones that are trying to uh, test out new solutions for, for making cities uh, function well, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and capture, maybe even policies like carbon fees and, and other new technologies for addressing climate change can be in introduced in cities. Also, I think uh, special economic zones can move towards more inclusive growth, inclusive development. This is true from like the Middle East to, to here in San Francisco. Um, or, or creating places of equality, opportunity, and prosperity where, uh, uh, where, where the zones can do what nations or states or even other cities are held back from doing by legal constraints. They can move, move things forward, including an in informality. Things like, um, you know, many businesses, uh, the laws are such that there's a huge, a huge proportion of people working in the informal sector, in the informal economy, because they can't legally operate a business. Zones can create place areas of exception where you can uh, uh, reform the laws so that, it's, it's, that it's easier to find a job and to start a business rather than working in the informal sector. I think we can do this with housing, too. I'm working on a project right now uh, that would be pushing for uh, in encouraging more development in U.S. cities, the, the, la the lack of ability to build in places like my home city of Los Angeles, including New York, and especially here in San Francisco, comes down to the demand for housing greatly exceeding the supply of housing. And the only thing that's keeping supply from growing is our, our restrictions on, on development. Um, uh, uh, under our proposal, we would have a special zone that would have uh, some delegated planning authority um, and uh, that, that would be able to reform the zones laws and make sure that people, the, the neighborhood residents, benefit from the property tax, uh, the added property tax that, that's derived from this new development. Uh, so that the wealth, so that the benefits of development can be shared with more people and, uh, and we can make sure that more development isn't just a burden on existing residents, but they actually something they directly benefit from. But we can also move forward in the areas of gender equality and LGBT rights, um, using zones to advance more, to create more open societies. Um, even outer space. Let's, let's think about like how can we, let's build a settlement in, 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 on the moon or Mars or in outer space that's modeled after principles that we can get from special economic zones. Because essentially we're going to need to create administrative authorities that learn to how to adapt to the special circumstances there. Uh, so I think that's something that I'm, I'm very excited about. The ways that we get there are First of all, mobilizing the private sector within a government, governance framework that aligns their incentives with the public good. I had mentioned revenue being tied to land value or maybe revenue from the private operators being tied to the number of residents moving in or other indicators of inclusion or environmental sustainability. We need to use zones to take the best ideas, best public policy ideas out there. Uh, and equipping the visionaries in various countries to showcase them through zones as good kind of political economy tools for advancing those reforms. And we need to launch new institutions. Uh, areas, uh, countries with, that are suffering under corrupt or bureaucratic institutions can form islands of good governance. This is something I'm uh, pushing for in, in Mexico right now. Uh, Mexico, the real underlying problems have to do with the political structures. And I think that their, their zones can be used to begin to introduce beneficial institutional change within the zones um, that reorient the leaders uh, that re reorient leaders incentives around inclusive economic growth so that's my message thank you for listening